Hi everybody. So, I have some uh, information here regarding the Civil War on this uh, tablet here that I wanted to briefly go over. Uh, and I, uh, I just didn't feel like doing a documentary this time like I've been doing. And as you know, I've been kind of doing this series on the Civil War uh, as the days go by. But uh, before I get into that, I want to honor the uh, American service members, uh, British and Canadians as well, who landed on Normandy on June 6, 1944. Your sacrifice is not forgotten. But anyway, I want to get into this. So, I meant to do this in the beginning of June on the 1st, when the anniversary of this particular date was, but I never quite got around to it. Uh, I had too much going on, but I'm doing it now. So, on June 1st, 1861, uh, as you know, the Civil War is kind of raging. Again, I have information on this tablet uh, that'll help me clarify this a little better. Uh, so, as you know, uh, the Civil War has just been going on for around two months or so. Yeah, about two months. Um, uh, the southern states are seceding. As the months go on, Virginia has just succeed has just seceded at this point in time, um, and Robert E. Lee has resigned from the U.S. Army and has been given command of the uh, <clears throat> citizen armies of Virginia. So, so I have information here regarding a um, a battle. This is the first land battle of the Civil War. This took place at uh, Fairfax Courthouse. Some of you might know where Fairfax is. It's a, uh, it's a town in Virginia. Um, so the first land battle of the Civil War um, was not Bull Run. Uh, uh, Bull Run, I'll, I'll go over Bull Run at a later date. Um, Bull Run was the first major battle of the Civil War, but I'm going over the first... <clears throat> First land battle of the Civil War, which would be Fairfax Courthouse, not to be confused with the battle that was at the, of the same name that was fought in June 1863, two years later. Um, but anyway, um, so the information I have here is um, I have troop movements, uh, I have commanders, what happened. Um, so. Uh, it, around the end of May, Confederate soldiers had occupied uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Um, this is very early on in the Civil War. The Confederacy really hasn't developed a proper military yet. Uh, they, their soldiers are very inexperienced and not trained. Um, so Fairfax Courthouse, it's about... a. Uh, 13 miles or so from Washington, D.C. Um, so, so there are 120 cavalrymen um, composing of two companies that occupy Fairfax, uh, Virginia. Uh, you have the Prince William Cavalry and the Rappahannock Cavalry. Uh, around 60 men each. So, I have, I have information on here to make it easier to, uh, to kind of go over everything, and make it easier to remember everything, because I did, I've done research on this prior to doing the video as, uh, that, that's what I kind of wanted to do, um, but I, I have information saved up on here, um, um, so we have also we have about uh, we have the um, the war the Warrington Rifles. These are all Confederate companies. Uh, the Warrington Rifles consist of about ninety men, um, and so Fairfax uh, was it was a village in Virginia com uh, at the time, uh, uh, composed of about three hundred inhabitants. Um, so, 
Lieutenant Colonel Richard S. Ewell. You know him as a Confederate general. If you know Civil War history, you know him as a Confederate general. Veteran of the Mexican-American War. Um, he was a, a, a cavalry man. Yeah, I think I got I think I got that information right. He was a cavalry man in the U.S. Army until he until he resigned from the from the U.S. Army to join the Confederacy. So um, Richard S. Ewell, you know him as the Confederate general, the uh, who took over as corps commander. He took over uh, General Stonewall Jackson's corps after he was killed at Chad Chancellorsville in eighteen sixty three. Um. So, Richard S. Ewell takes command uh, of these untrained soldiers in the Confederacy at Fairfax. Um, and he, you know, he kind of arrived in the town prior to the battle and met with some of the officers. Uh, you know, he had no introduction to the enlisted men, no experience with them. Um, so we have Captain John Q. Marr. Captain Marr was a... He, he commanded the Warrington Rifles that I mentioned before. They were the infantry unit uh, that composed of 90 men. Um, so on the... Uh, there, there were two pickets posted. And uh, sorry, I'm trying to. I'm trying. I'm kind of reading a little bit what's going on. So I'm trying. I'm trying to make it easier to get an understanding of what's going on. So we have two pickets posted. Um, on the road east of the town, um, it. Two pickets wasn't a lot. Um, that because there was little threat, and there there was little believability of a uh, threat from the Union, the Union forces, um, at this time. So there were two p pickets posted east of town. Um, it was the night of May thirty first, eighteen sixty one. Um, but but the Federals were closer than they thought. Uh, they they underestimated they they underestimated how close the Union troops were. Um, so um, as we know, any Civil War enthusiast knows that there is a Confederate buildup at Manassas Junction in uh, Virginia. Um, it was. You know, um, the day after the the battle of Fairfax Courthouse, uh, General P.G.T. Beauregard takes command of the Confederate armies in Northern Virginia, um, and he prepares his troops at Manassas Junction, where there is, as I just mentioned, a Confederate buildup. Um... So we have that going on, and that inevitably leads to Bull Run, because, you know, we had the Army of the Potomac in the Union that had just been created days before uh, with General Irvin McDowell taking command. So, anyway, uh, Manassas is about 10 miles or so farther uh, south of Fairfax. Um, so we have we have Union Brigadier General David Hunter giving orders to Lieutenant uh, Charles Henry Tompkins of the Second U.S. Cavalry Regiment. Um, you know he kind of just tells him to gather information on the Confederate buildup at Fairfax, Virginia. Um, uh, you know he kind he kind of just tells him to scout ahead, scout the Confederate numbers, see what they got. You know, just kind of survey the Confederate forces in the area. Uh, and, uh, he kind of made it vague. But, 
but his, his instructions were to gather info. His instructions of entering Fairfax Courthouse were vague, as I, I just mentioned. And uh, he encouraged a probe to discover more information. So, it was around 10.30 p.m. on the evening of, uh, of May 31st um, when the Confederacy discovers that there is more of a, a federal buildup advancing on Fairfax, Virginia than was initially thought. Um, they underestimated the federal determination to attack. Uh, so it was on the evening of May 31st, around 10.30 p.m. Uh, when Tompkins led a Union force between 50 to 86 Army cavalrymen Dragoons, uh, uh, a few volunteers from Camp Union at Falls Church, Virginia. And they, and they kind of lead reconnaissance of the area in the direction of Fairfax Courthouse. The reconnaissance is just kind of scouting. You know, they're scouting, gathering info, troop movements, troop strength, weapons, whatnot. And they, you got all that. So in the early morning hours, the very early morning hours of June 1st, 1861, it was around 3 o'clock a.m., uh, uh, Private A.B. Francis was one of the Confederate pickets, one of the two Confederate pickets that was posted east of town. And uh, he, he ran into the town, ironically similar to what happened at uh, Lexington and Concord, you know, kind of the British are coming type of thing by this time. The Union Army's coming. Yeah, that's basically what went down. And he ran into Fairfax Courthouse, um, shouting that the enemy was upon them. So, the other picket, B.F. Florence, who was posted with him, had been captured by this time. Now, keep in mind that the Confederates were ill-equipped and untrained at soldiers. The Prince William's Cavalry uh, tried to form a line of battle to prepare for the, the attack. They tried to form a line of battle in the streets while others ran for their horses. And the Union Army kind of... Uh, Arrived at Falls Church Road, uh, yeah, which provoked most of the Confederate cavalrymen to flee. Uh, and they were inexperienced, untrained. They weren't an army at all by any means. Uh, uh, four, four of them with the Prince William cavalry were taken prisoner. So around this time, Captain Marr, who I talked about earlier, um, Captain Marr moved his men into the clover field west of the Methodist Church, where they had been camped just off Little River Turnpike, and formed into two lines of battle. And, uh, there, there was a lot of confusion. Around this time, it was dark. You couldn't see. Uh, this was a common. This was a mistake that happened a few different times during the Civil War. Um, it was dark. Couldn't see. Didn't know who the enemy was. Uh, so uh, the fleeing cavalry kind of came upon Captain Marr's men, and uh, and uh, Marr's men opened fire on them not knowing that they were their own men, wounding one of their cavalrymen in the process. Now, 
If you remember stories of the Civil War, the same thing is what killed in 1863. The same thing killed Stonewall Jackson, killed by his own men in the dead of night. And General James Longstreet was wounded in a very similar manner, but he survived. He was wounded at the wilderness in 1864, a year, a year after Jackson's death. Um, so, the Rappahannock cavalrymen had few weapons and no ammunition. So when the Union soldiers arrived, they, they advanced in numbers. Well, not really numbers, they just... They, they advanced in force, is what I mean to say. Um, the, uh, the Rappahannock Cavalry also fled, having little weapons and ammun no little to no weapons and ammunition. So, considering that this is a ra this is a time when uh, when we had no we had no video cameras and, and none of that stuff, so. All, all accounts come from witnesses. So you had to rely on witnesses to tell the story. No video cameras, nothing. Uh, so there are several accounts. Some There are several accounts that Captain Marr challenged the writers asking something like, What cavalry is that? Um... These are reported to have been his last words, because Captain Marr was killed during the engagement on June 1st. Uh, um, uh, the Union Cavalry rode through the town, uh, scat and they firing around, uh, the shots scattering, and Captain Marr, Captain Marr was hit, and he fell dead. So there are some other accounts, of course, we don't know if this is true or not. I, we kind of just have these eyewitness accounts to go on that, um, that some other accounts say he was killed while scouting out a better position for his men a little distance away from their line and do not mention a challenge to the Union horsemen. So, it's unknown whether he had moved up to challenge the Union Riders or to scout out a better position for his company. So, one account goes one way, one goes the other. We don't know what the truth is, but those are two of the most common accounts of Captain Marr's death. So, Captain Marr... Captain Marr was uh, not in the immediate presence uh, or a line of sight of any of his men on the very dark night when he fell in the dense field. So no, no one really knew where he was or where he had fallen. Uh, they didn't know what happened to him. Later in the morning, his body was recovered in the clover field. And Captain Marr, however, is not the first officer to be killed in, in the Civil War. The first one has to go to uh, Colonel uh, Elmsworth. Elmsworth was a uh, close personal friend to President Abraham Lincoln. Um, he was uh, he was killed trying to uh, trying to take down the Confederate banner, but um, we're not talking about that. So, but it's a nice to note. So the Union force continued to ride west through town, um, fire, firing shots at random. There are many accounts of the battle that suggest that that uh, Union troops fired at a man emerging from the hotel in his town who is identified as Lieutenant Colonel at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Yule, who was wounded in the shoulder. He was hit in the shoulder. Uh, 
Yep. So this makes Richard Yule the first Confederate field grade officer to be wounded in the Civil War. Um... So at this time, at this time, the Prince William Cavalry is still fleeing from the scene, um, and they ride right on through by the Union force uh, and the men of the uh, of the Warrington Rifle Infantry Company realize that Captain Marr was no longer present, meaning he was already dead by dead by this time. Um, Captain Marr, I meant to mention this earlier, but I didn't, but Captain Marr was the, um, for, he was the, uh, first combat casualty of the Civil War. And I'm not, and I'm not counting the men, and I'm not counting the man that was wounded earlier by his own man, men. Um, yeah. To differentiate a casualty from a, it, it is a common misconception that a casualty means a death. Um, casualty can mean dead, wounded, or missing. So there's that little tidbit too. But uh. The company was uh, the the company was temporarily leaderless after Mar fell. And two lieutenants were on leave, and Yule had not yet arrived on the scene. So there was a former and subsequent. Governor of Virginia Governor and later Major General William Extra Billy Smith. He resigned his seat within the U.S. Congress and he emerged with his rifle from the house where he was staying on his trip back home to Warrington from Washington, D.C. He was a 64 year old civilian um, and had helped recruit the company and knew many of the men. So he helped recruit many of the infantry from the Warrington Rifles. Um, he took he took charge of the company, despite his lack of military training and experience. Yeah, keep in mind he was a, a con he was a congressman, not a soldier. Uh, he just re recently resigned his seat from the U.S. Congress. To join the Confederacy. So, uh, Yule soon arrived on the scene, but the men uh, had to be assured by Smith that uh, that he was who he said he was. And Yule was the acting Confederate officer. In command uh, before they would follow. So, Yule takes command of the Warrington Rifles at around this time and he places approximately 40 men that he had found at the edge of the clover field between the hotel and the court house or the Episcopal Church where they were able to turn the Union force back to the west with a volley as the cavalry approached the Confederate position on their return trip through town. So Yule arrives. Um, Yule has military experience as a veteran of the Mexican-American War. He has military experience. So he comes in, he takes control of the situation, he assesses the situation, and decides it's best to place these 40 infantrymen along here to open up a volley of fire that send the Union in retreat back to the West. So 
So the Virginians, the Virginians are not in a good position to defend themselves. Um, and Yule, Yule realizes the situation. Yule's a good commander. He, he was one, he was one of the better command, commanders the Confederates had during the Civil War. He was one of Lee's, uh, better commanders. And he recognizes that the Virginians are not in a good position to defend themselves. So, so he sends, he sends a courier to, uh, find reinforcements. He sends a courier to go out for reinforcements, and Smith moves the men to a more defensible position behind the rail fences about a hundred yards closer to the turnpike. So, uh, civilians uh, around this time, sheltered in buildings, they take up arms as well to defend their town, and they joined in the shooting at the Union horsemen. And they, they also may have contributed to Tompkins. I mentioned Tompkins earlier. He was a Union commander. He was a Union uh, officer. Um, he may have, uh, these civilians may have contributed to the men his force had encountered. So the Warrington rifles had driven them back by a volley of musket fire and civilian volunteers. The Union forces driven back and they try to come back through town again. The Warrenton rifle, the Warrenton riflemen again are forced to retreat with another three volleys. So there's a little exchange fire going on here. Um, and Lieutenant Tom Tompkins had two horses shot out from under him. Two horses shot out from under. And, uh, and one of them fell and injured, injured his foot. So, he had two horses shot out from under him, one injured him. But he is okay, he's still alive. And the Confederates continue to fire additional volleys at the Confederate. The Confederates try to fire, they do fire additional volleys at the Federals as they try to pass through town again on their way back to their base at Camp Union near Falls Church, Virginia. So there is a third, after this third failed attempt to ride through the, the town passed by, town past the Confederates, the Union Cavalry are for, finally forced to leave town through the fields toward Flint Hill in the Oakton area of Fairfax County in the north of the city of Fairfax and return to Camp Union by a longer route. The, uh, the Confederates, the Confederates initially report casualties in the affair of one dead, Captain Marin, four later reduced to two wounded, including Lieutenant Colonel Yule and one missing. A later Confederate account states otherwise that only two were wounded, but five were captured, which is in accord with the Union account, which states five prisoners were taken and actually names them. The Union force report reported one killed, four wounded, including Lieutenant Tompkins, and one missing. The Union soldier killed was identified as Private St. Clair. The Confederates stated that they took three prisoners and recent accounts agree. And the Union force had also lost nine horses killed and four wounded. So, so the, uh, the Battle of uh, Fairfax, Virginia, as I stated earlier, was the first land battle of the Civil War. Fort Sumter was the first engagement of the Civil War, but Fairfax Courthouse was the first land battle fought. 
So besides the loss of Captain Marr, Confederate commanders, including Brigadier General Millage Luke Bonham, who was in overall command of the area, he was unhappy about the lack of arms and ammunition, which, uh, which led about the uh, the retreat of the Confederate cavalry. And Union General in Chief Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott was uh, uh, he was general during the Mexican American War, and I believe he had experience in the War of 1812 as well, and at this time, he's the General-in-Chief of all Union armies. Um, and he was displeased at Tompkins' impetuous charge, which Scott thought exceeded his orders to scout the Confederate positions. So there's much more information to go about the battle, um, if you want to look it up. You can, you can probably find something somewhere from the American Battlefield Trust. There is no one I trust more with information on the Civil War. And uh, so I kind of I kinda read uh, a little bit of my research from the Battle of Fairfax Courthouse. Because I didn't really feel like memorizing everything and then just saying it on video. But So I kind of read... Um, <clears throat> kind of read and gave out my information, my two cents about the battle. Uh, I hope all of this was helpful. And uh, so we're, we're uh, just a month away from the battle. The ma first major battle of the Civil War, uh, First Manassas or Bull Run, as the Union Army called it. Um, keep in mind, at this time, both armies are cocky. Both armies are immature. Both armies think that they're the, they're gonna whip the other army within three months. And in three months, they'll be going home to their families victorious. That's what they believe at this point. But in a month time, they're going. Both sides are going to be proven wrong, and the civil war is going to turn into a four-year-long bloody conflict. Um, but anyway, uh, I hope all this information was helpful. Uh, I decided today instead of doing a documentary, which I initially wanted to do, that I would just that I would just pull up information that I had on my tablet. And, uh, and I, I would kind of, uh, make it easier on myself today. Um, um, just kind of, just kind of give a background of the battle and a general, uh, description. So, that's what I did. But anyway, I hope you, uh, enjoyed this talk. Um... And I guess I'll see you in the next video.